Before we start, are there any quick questions about the, the assignments? No? It's all very clear, good. Um, the next assignments will be posted tomorrow. So this assignment is due tomorrow, right? Because we're now kind of shifted by a day. We, we might at some point be able to shift it back, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, but that means that we'll we'll post the new assignments uh, tomorrow, and it'll, it'll have something to do with randomness. So get ready for random. Uh, so I'm just making sure my screens are okay. okay that should work. The slides. Yeah, I'll I'll do that right after. Um, sorry, I, I I forgot to upload the slides. Okay. All right, so today um, we are going to talk about molecular dynamics. So it's, it's an application of scientific computing, um, a very widely used one. And um, so we felt we can leave it out of this uh, series of lectures, um, but there are some funny things about it, uh, as, as we will see. So first, what, what do I mean by molecular dynamics or molecular dynamic simulations? It's, it's used in, um, in chemical physics, material science, uh, modeling of biomolecules, and, uh, and in a sort of generalized form, it's also used for uh, many body uh, simulations, although they have some of their own peculiarities. So collections of stars, et cetera. Uh, but from a model perspective, these are, interactive particles they are usually macroscopic but they don't have to be um, so think atoms molecules nanoparticles but as i said you can also think stars um, and they follow classical equations of motion so newton's equation of motion ma equals the force right um, you give some initial conditions you specify the forces that all of these particles act on one another and then you have an ordinary differential equation, or really a lot of them that are coupled uh, to solve. So you'd think that we just go back to our, our ODE lecture, and this is the end of, uh, of discussing molecular dynamics. Um, but it's not that simple. So uh, just, just to, to keep setting up this, this why um, this is not so simple, this is what happens in a, in a molecular dynamic simulation algorithmically. Uh, you have to start with uh, initializing the system. So all these particles have to go somewhere. And that um, <clears throat> that is not trivial at all uh, because you don't know where they're supposed to go. So suppose you're simulating a, uh, a liquid, say water. Um, if you put your initial water molecules in a non-physical location, you'll get all kinds of weird behavior, at least initially, um, that, that could cause trouble also numerically. Okay. So you have to have a reasonable initial condition. The same with like, uh, you want to know how a galaxy evolves. You have to put your stars, your, your masses somewhere. Um, <clears throat> if, that's, if it's a dilute system, so if they're far apart, it might not matter as much, but sometimes it matters a lot. Um, then you want to solve the equation of motion. So you want to discretize time, like we did in the ordinary differential equations, and then move the particles from one time point to the next. So that's very much like our, uh, our ODEs. Um, we want to make sure that we solve the differential equations to some good approximation. Um, and and then, then this is an important part. Every time I take a time step, those forces on the right-hand side of, of Newton's equations of motion, uh, they change. So they have to be recomputed. And we're typically after many, many time steps. And I'm talking billions of time steps. So those two last two things are, um, are sort of specific to this application, so to molecular dynamics and also to n-body dynamics, in that um, we have to take many, many time steps to find the evolution that we want. Um, and uh, the forces that have to be computed are fairly expensive to compute. Every particle in principle can interact with every other particle. Right. So uh, in addition, these are systems that are usually either isolated or have some sort of conserved quantities. So they will obey Hamiltonian dynamics. That is nice in a sense, because you can actually exploit that to, uh, to come up with faster algorithms. So typical solvers like our Runga Kata that we saw for ODEs, um, 
require a lot of force evaluations. And the force evaluations are going to be very expensive. And so you don't want to do that. And so you're going to have to find some sort of balance where uh, your system is not as accurately solved as you would if you if you followed like a, a, a very precise Runge kata. But that's OK, because all of the physics is still there. So for molecular dynamics, then, um, we're typically th thinking about uh, molecules, large molecules, maybe embedded in a, in a liquid. Think, uh, I don't know, uh, biomembranes or, or a transport of um, chemicals in a, in a fluid or, or something like that. And what that means is that in real, the real, mo real system we're after has a lot of particles, like 10 to the order, like order 10 to the 23, right? It's what is in a, a typical cubic centimeter of, uh, of, of water. So that's, that's a lot of particles. We're not going to be able to fit those into the computer. Like we, can't, we can't even begin to approximate that. Um, so that's a problem. We need a large number of particles for this to be realistic. And how large depends. But if we're not careful, we'll, still, we'll see all kinds of finite size effects if you take too, too few particles. Uh, how much is too few? Well, two is definitely too few. Is a thousand enough? It depends. Um, at the same time that we have a large number of particles that can all interact with one another, we have different kinds of forces that act at the same time. So the, the expression of the force itself is rather complicated. Some of the forces are what we call short range, and we'll see a few examples of that. Um, others are long range, and the difference matters a lot. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about those. And then in addition, and this is very specific to molecular dynamics, so um, all of the other ones are kind of true for, for uh, n-body uh, gravitational systems as well, where you, you don't really have that much short range stuff. The long, long range is very important. For molecular dynamics, um, in addition to that, you often have an, an environment that you can interact with. So for instance, um, if, you, if you simulate a, a biomolecule, you want it at a specific temperature. Now, systems stay at a certain temperature by being in contact with a with an environment that has this this temperature so you have to model that as well and there is not there's no way to model this in a sort of realistic way where you say well i just take my 10 to the 23rd uh, particles and i put them somewhere and then i put them in a vessel and that vessel i pick, put in contact with an even larger reservoir of particles that have a specific uh, uh, temperature <coughs> excuse me so that that's that's not going to work. You need some sort of uh, let's say fake modeling of exchange of energy if you want to, to have a system at specific temp temperature. Some way to exchange volume with a, a, a reservoir that you don't really simulate. So some 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 way of, of changing the volume uh, if you want your system to be at a specific pressure. If you want a system at a specific chemical potential, um, then you have to exchange particle numbers, etc. So those are uh, those are kind of things that will deviate or sometimes deviate from the Hamiltonian picture of the, of the dynamics and have to also be taken into account. So let's for a moment just look at an isolated system that does not uh, interact or exchange either energy or particles or, uh, or volume uh, to, with, with the, the environment. And so, um, even in that sense, in that case, we have sort of we have pure Hamiltonian dynamics. So the, the particles just go according to Newton's equation of motion. But what we often want is to compute equilibrium uh, or dynamical properties of this of this system. But they're always averages. Um, that the this is the realm of equilibrium of uh, statistical mechanics or statistical physics. And uh, we're all we're just looking at classical uh, systems here. But even so. Um, we have to find these equilibrium properties or the dynamical properties are often also uh, expressible in an in equilibrium property where essentially there is a measure of, let's say it's pressure. And as you are computing these equations of motion, um, you can compute those properties and take the average and that gives you your, your, your uh, final pressure. So in these kind of systems with no exchange with the environment, the energy is conserved. Um, and that's a, a good property to check. So when you have a, 
a way to solve your ordinary differential equations and you would apply it to say this system, you could check if the, if the energy is conserved and to what extent. It, it won't be perfectly conserved and that's okay as long as it doesn't um, like increase indefinitely or decrease indefinitely and the fluctuations around the actual intended values are small. So um, let's look at this energy again, because this energy will also determine um, how the system behaves because it's, it's part of this uh, uh, potential here. So the potential here contains all of the forces that's the, or its derivative to, with respect to every position of every particle. And so you've got as many forces as you have particles, but every one of those forces that a particle feels is going to be a sum of forces of uh, coming from the other particles. So the potential energy, this U, is typically a sum of pair potentials. Um, this doesn't have to be exactly the case, um, but it's often the way that things are modeled. And so what you could say is you could write this U, which is the total potential energy as a sum over pairs. So I and J are two of the particles in your system. Phi R I J is then a pair potential between uh, those particles, which just depends on their distance. That is a very typical way. It's not the only way if you have things like uh, magnetic uh, fields or something, then there, there, this changes, but or mag magnetic moments. But let's just, uh, for simplicity, consider just this case. So uh, to be more explicit, we're summing from I equals one to N and being the number of particles and for all of the other particles, and then we have the pair potential. And what that means is that the force is a double sum over I and J of some sort of vector quantity that involves uh, phi prime, so the derivative of phi. This double sum is what makes it so troublesome. Like you have a lot of particles, it grows as, as the square of the number of particles. And so very quickly you will you will have a very slow algorithm. So you make your size, you make your number of particles twice as big, you now need to compute four times as much. But typically what you would want to do, because these are almost always three-dimensional three systems, is that if you make your system twice as large, you make it twice as large in every direction. So it's eight times as large now in terms of the, the, the volume, which means that if the density was the same, we now have 64 times uh, as, as expensive in operation. So it really grows very quickly, um, uh, the, the amount of uh, force evaluations that you would have to do. Okay, so let's get back to the study of, of wanting equilibrium properties. So that is uh, within the realm of, of molecular dynamic simulations typically. Um, so we want to compute, say, some property like like the pressure, for instance, or uh, or the total, or the, the maybe we want to know what the average potential energy is, um, something like that. So uh, we can do different constraints. We we just talked about uh, an isolated system that will give you a, a microcanonical uh, ensemble average. Um, if you have fluctuations of temperature and volume, you can do uh, various canonical ensembles. Um, so the microcanonical ensemble, let's look at that one. Um, because this is not a lecture on physical on, on statistical physics, uh, but it is uh, used in that context. So let's just look at this idea of a what is called a microcanonical average. The microcanonical average is an average over all configurations of a system that correspond to it to the same energy. So you fix an energy, and you consider all configurations of your system that have that energy. So we can we can look at that, and we can formally say that 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 works this way. If x is all possible configurations, then in this case that is actually both positions and velocities. So x is sort of a notation for all of those variables. Um, and there's some property a that I want to know. Then I can find the average over all configurations by integrating over all possible values of x, uh, such that the energy uh, function h is equal to the, the uh, prescribed value e. Okay, so it depends on e, and otherwise it's some number. Um, that's that's great, but you know this is kind of like our, our integration issue where we we have to integrate over many many uh, degrees of freedom, and and there's no way where we can do that in a regular fashion where we take a regular grid, say we take ten points in every direction, and uh, we have ten to the twenty third uh, dimensions, and so. We have 10 to the 23rd to the 10th uh, number of points to take. There's no way we can do that either, right? So uh, 
we're exploiting in these sort of simulations the fact that we we can assume and sometimes prove that these systems are what is called ergodic and when they're ergodic um, that's a property of the system that is often hard to prove but if it's true you can replace this integral over all possible values uh, of x by an integral over the time evolution of a single trajectory so you start in some initial uh, point and then as time goes on it it moves through phase space and it, it visits every point proportionally to this uh, this measure that you really want. Um, that works only in the limit of large times. So now the question is how large is that time? But that's something you can kind of gauge because you could do your simulation, you could compute averages and sort of see when they plateau out. And then you haven't proved that that is the actual average, but if they didn't plateau out, you have proved that it is not. So it's sort of a uh, an assumption that it's ergodic, which you can only prove for very few systems, but if but you're going to assume that anyway. And then you're going to take those time averages over the trajectory, and they are equal to your microeconomical average, which uh, in, in, in statistical physics is equal to your thermodynamic properties. So this is why people in uh, statistical physics do uh, molecular dynamic simulations in a sense like they it's not because they want to know where all the, the the molecules go at every time that that's not all that important they want to know something about um, i don't know affinities or how well a, a drug can bind to uh, uh to a virus say and that those kind of things we want to know um in average not not the actual trajectory but we use that because its average over time gives us the quantity we want um, now, the simulations can, of course, only give a finite number of, of configurations. We are still sampling uh, configurations at times. So we have to make sure that the time is long enough. Another thing that can also happen, or that you also have to do, is um, since we don't know how to start off the system, there, there are preferred configurations and rare configurations. We do not know which is which, per se. Um, so we make an initial guess of where what is reasonable for these for these particles to to be at and then we let it go but we are wrong there's no way we can be right because we don't know so in in the beginning stages of your of your dynamics in this dynamic state the beginning stages of the simulation um your system is going to go through all kinds of weird configurations but because they're all rare it will eventually find some more common uh, configurations the thing is that initial part could have such strange configurations that you can have big spikes of the quantity a where they are really rare and so these pollute your average so often people equilibrate their uh, their system that's what they call it uh, by just dropping the initial part of your simulation so it's some t equilibrium you just say that's just the system finding equilibrium and i i you know i don't want those uh, artifacts to pollute my my actual average so that's something you do. Uh, sometimes they call this burn-in time. And like here, I don't know exactly why, but that's what they call it. Um, now, this is one way of sampling. So we're of this of, of computing this integral. And it's nice because dynamics tends to find uh, a way to arrange the particles in a natural state. Uh, Monte Carlo would work as well. Um, so the random uh, uh, simulations or the, the random uh, stuff that, that Marcelo talked about where you could have a particle and you displace it a little bit and you, you compute the energy and you, you try and, and compute averages that way is another way to sample phase space and it is valid um, and if it's a, a fairly system fairly simple system it's probably just as good uh, but there's two things first the dynamics isn't real but that didn't really matter here because it's uh, it's just if you're after the average, after sampling. Um, but also, as I said, the, the Hamiltonian dynamics tends to find the right spots. Whereas with Monte Carlo, we have to decide what our moves are. And so they could be very unphysical and, and not lead very quickly to the right answer. In other words, bad decisions of, of, of the Monte Carlo process would, would need you to use large equilibration times before you can actually do a, uh, a measurement and Hamilton dynamics can sometimes suffer that but tend to not not as much so you can you can sort of see more clearly what's going on 
And of course, if you ever do want a dynamical process, say you want it to simulate what happens if you take a, a container and half of it is filled with gas and you let, you let it go and you want to know that, then Hamiltonian dynamics kind of makes a little bit more sense than Monte Carlo uh, as a closer approximation to the truth. So it is a dynamics too. So um, often we do want to know non-equilibrium dynamics as well. Uh, think of protein folding, um, chemical reactions, phase transitions. And in that case, um, depending on the model, but in that case, Hamiltonian dynamics makes, makes a lot of sense as well. So actual dynamics rather than choosing a, 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 a random step and see how it goes. Okay, so things matter. How you model things matter. How you make, how you exchange things with the environment matters. But uh, those are all extra things. Um, there are ways to improve equilibrium sampling. So you could imagine that if the Hamiltonian dynamics doesn't get you into the states that you want, say you have a long polymer and you know, it has a hard time um, folding over one another because it has to pass through it, you can in Monte Carlo make an artificial step that just passes it through this. And, and you just, just correct for the unlikeness, un unlikelihood of it. Um, so there are ways to improve equilibrium sampling, um, in, but they might not work for a dynamical sampling because now you're, you in, introduce artifacts of the dynamics. Um, so, it's, so it's hard to reach enough time scales to see uh, microscopic dynamics. This is, this is, so if you want dynamics, if you want protein folding, phase transitions, chemical reactions, they take place of, on a time scale that needs many billions of time steps. So uh, uh, we saw in the, the, uh, the ODE lecture that the size of your time step matters. And if your time step is too big, you can get a, uh, an unstable system. You can sometimes have a, a system that's already unstable always, but even if it's stable, um, there's typically a limit to how big your time step can be. And that is actually set by physical time scales at which things happen on a molecular scale. And these, little particles move very quickly, which means that the time scale that corresponds to that is very short. But we are after uh, I don't know, milliseconds or seconds uh, uh, in, into a process, whereas our time steps have to be of the order of picoseconds. So it's really difficult to reach large enough time scales. So forget about even the, the fact that the forces are really hard to compute. Now we have to compute for a very, very long time. So these are very elaborate computations. Okay. So we're going to try and, and help this system out. Um, so we know the forces are, are horribly uh, expensive to compute. We know we need many, many time steps. We can't really help the many, many time steps too much. You can, uh, but I'm not going to go into how you would do that. But when you have a time evolution, you have to compute the previous time step before you can do the next time step. And so you, you you're sort of stuck. You can't just fake it and skip a few, a few steps. Um, but what we can do is try and attach, uh, attack how we compute the right hand side of these equations, the forces. Uh, and so one of the things that we, we want to do is um, the forces grow as n squared. And so at least uh, for now, so let's see how small we can make n. So we want to simulate a finite system, right? Um, but something that is really, really large. And so uh, how you do that uh, matters a lot. So one way you could do that is say, okay, I want to simulate a, a liter of water. Uh, I can't, so I'm going to simulate a, a, a nanoliter of water. Um, that's a smaller system. Um, but how do I keep that water into that nano, that, that, that cubic nanometer, right? Well, I, how would I do that? But I could put in walls. So just create a, a wall force. Um, when the particle hits the wall, it gets bounced off. Doing that at such a small time scale has really large finite size effects. That means the water acts very differently than it would if that wall wasn't there. Imagine having that many walls in a, in a glass of water. You could imagine it actually hard to drink out of. Um, so rather than doing that, uh, we come up with different uh, boundary conditions that are uh, more artificial, but better to, uh, to mimic a very large system. And uh, one of the most common ones is a periodic boundary condition. So that kind of goes like this. Here's, here's a, uh, a, a large system of particles, but what I'm really simulating is just the red square. 
So rather than having this, what would it be about 50 particles? I take a, I take a look at these six particles. And what I do is I'm going to duplicate them. So this square here is, is where my particles are, what I keep track of. There's another square to the left of it, to the, to, to the top in all directions. This is in 2D, but you can imagine doing the same in 3D. And by definition, these particles in the other squares are at the same position as here, just shifted. Why is this called a periodic boundary condition? Well, it means it is because if this particle moves off on the right hand side, then that means there's another one of his, uh, his periodic images that is moving in from the left. So it's moving here and then it's like it's, it's, it's flipping around and coming back on the other side. So that's the way you, you can simulate this system of many, many particles. Um, in fact, in, in a sense, there are infinitely many particles, but only keep, but fixing that, uh, that they have to be related in, in their positions uh, in, in, this, in this fashion. This is sometimes called a, uh, a checkerboard uh, system. So, so we're doing infinite repetition of a finite volume. So our volume in the sense is, is now infinite, but the number of possibilities is no longer infinite and that's, that's how it helps. Um, so all the particles say that the size of this system here is L. Um, so let's say our nanometer, right? Um, then we can say that the particle coordinates have to lie between minus L over two and plus L over two. And as soon as they drift away from that, we just put them back on the other side. We keep subtracting that, um, right? So any particle that exits the simulation box, this is what we call the simulation box, is put on the other side. Um, and so this is the simulation box. So when you have a periodic boundary, boundary condition, you don't use walls at all. There are no walls. So what that in, in essence means, because these particles can move, is that you, you fix the density of the system, right? The average density or the number of particles you found, but really the average density. Um, yes. Okay, so we call these the actual particles and the others the periodic images. Um, and we're still not quite done because this, this does solve that we don't only need a finite number of, of particles, but then an infinite or uh, un, unimaginably uh, large number. Um, but we still have to compute the forces. And if we believe this picture, there's still infinitely many possible interactions because this uh, particle can interact with, uh, with his um, colleague here on the left, but also to his colleague that is shifted, et cetera, et cetera. And there's infinitely many of them. Um, so let's look at a, uh, at a uh, particular force because you could imagine that the the particles that are far away might not matter all that much. And, and in fact, one of the very typical um, potential that is used in, uh, in computing uh, molecular dynamics is a Leonard Jones potential. So this doesn't work for every possible particle particle interaction, but for neutral uh, spherical particles, uh, or spherical atoms say, this is not a bad approximation. Things that think, think of like noble gas uh, atoms, things like that. This is not a bad. Um, Zeon, argon, those, those kind of things. They can, to good approximation, be modeled as if they interact. So you have two, say, argon atoms. Um, argon is very popular in, in, as, a, as a model in that case because it kind of fits. Um, so we have uh, a pair potential and the energy that is felt the, uh, it depends on the separation of the two argon atoms and uh, it, it kind of works like this. So there's an, an R to the minus uh, 12 and an R to the uh, minus six. Uh, the R to the minus 12 is the repulsion part here. And the R to the minus six is the, the attraction. So why it's attractive? Because if they, the particle one is, if the distance is somewhere around here, there's a tendency to want to go to lower energies. So it, could, it, it attracts and here, um, it's their, their same tendency makes them uh, repel each other. Um, sigma here is just the range of the, of the potential. I think for the plot, I've probably set it to one or something like that. And you can control the strength, the uh, epsilon as well, which gives you the depth. Um, this is a, a potential that is realistic. The, the 10 to the minus six is a, a, a physical uh, parameter. It is, it is the, the way Van der Waals 
uh, interactions work for neutral atoms. Um, you, could, you could compute it. You need some quantum mechanics to compute it, by the way, which is funny, but uh, that works. Um, so this is true, and you see it, it does level up very, very fast. So one thing we could try is to say, well, um, if we have so many particles and we, we need to compute infinitely many um, um, pairs, we don't want to do that. Let's try and cut off this range. Um, this is a, a funny typo. So the interactive, the, so we turn the interaction range off a little bit. Um, and there's some other tricks that I'll, I'll talk about that we can do. But let's look, look at this cutoff for a moment. So let's assume that we change our potential from our old potential, but then once it's at beyond a certain cutoff distance, we just set it to zero. We just plainly set it to zero. Um, and I've plotted the two differences here, and you can actually hardly see the difference. So this should be a small effect. And in fact, for something that, uh, that falls off as, as r to the sixth, it actually turns out this is a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, you can play with where the cutoff should be. So this is relative to the, the interaction range. Um, you could put it larger or, or less large, you could control it and see if things converge. Uh, but 2.5 is a very typical uh, uh, point to cut these things up. And what happens with that, sorry, what happens with that now is that, um, let's look at the, the checkerboard again. It's not, if this cutoff is say, half the size of this box, for instance, then um, the only particles that a given particle interact with are those in its own box and in the, in the neighboring boxes. So there's now a finite number of interactions left rather than infinite. I don't have to compute the interaction of this person, this, this particle with uh, this particle, for instance, because they're too far away. So now I've turned the number of atoms to something manageable and the number of force computations to something at least finite. So that's, that's a lot better, but not just finite. In fact, um, it no longer grows strictly as n squared if, um, if my, my, uh, my cutoff is, is smaller than the box size. So typical Rs are of the order of angstrom, so 10 to the minus 10 uh, meters. Okay, so we have, we have um, a cutoff RC and imagine that that is smaller than the simulation box. So here I, I set the cutoff to be a quarter of the simulation box. Usually your simulation box is quite a few times larger than the, the cutoff radius. And um, now I could still, I could go in and compute all of the interactions between all of the particles in this cell, which would still be N squared, where N is now the number of particles in just this, this cell. But even within this division, there's no reason to compute the interaction between the guy on the top left and, and, and this, uh, this girl at the, at the bottom right, because they're too far apart. So I can put an extra layer on top of this. So, so the simulation box is just a, and, and, and the, uh, the periodic images are just a construct. They will never actually be in your program. You just um, store the particles in your simulation box, right? But then that simulation box, you could further subdivide in cells that are the size of the cutoff. And when you do that, when you put your particles, you figure out where the particles are and which, in which cell they are, then the particles in one cell only, let's look at this person here. So then this, this particle here can only interact with cells. So not, not images, but cells that are in its immediate uh, neighborhood cells, right? And for this one, it doesn't matter too much. You, you, you gain maybe a factor of two or something, not even that. But if there's a lot of cells that fit into your simulation box, then this is, a, this is an additional uh, trick that moves your n squared to something of an order n, order n times the number of typical neighbors that you have. So now it depends on the density, what, what, how many neighbors you interact with as a particle. But, uh, but that's that given a certain density, that is a fixed amount, right? That is no longer growing with the size of the system. So that's fantastic for short range interactions like these. So interactions that I can cut off at some point, I can turn this n squared computation into something of order n. There's a prefactor and it can be fairly substantial, but at least I can now make my system uh, have uh, twice as many particles 
and 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 only have to compute twice as as, as long. Okay. Uh, you can further refine that because you can imagine that the particles are just on the edge of this uh, uh, edge corner of one of the box of the the cells actually don't interact with anything in in the neighboring cells. So you can do more refined things called uh, neighbor lists, um, but I, I I don't want to get into that detail right here. But um, that can give you not a, a different scaling, but a different prefactor. So that rather than having like 10 times n, you get like three times n or something like that. Um, I actually don't know what the prefactors would be. Okay. The trouble now is with the other kinds of interactions. So this is neutral interactions, uh, interactions between neutral particles. Um, and that works great, um, but both, but that's not the only systems we're interested in. We often have either, say, an n-body simulation with gravity, and gravity goes as one over r squared, and that that doesn't cut off very nicely. Electrostatics. Uh, so a lot of biomolecules have charges, or if they don't have charges, they might have dipoles. Uh, if you work with water at all, those those uh, particles have have dipoles, and so they have interactions that fall off at long ranges, but not very fast. Um, so electric static is one of the more common ones for, for molecular dynamics. Um, and so if the cutoff, you would want to put up a cutoff, but really for it to be to be meaningful, you'd basically have to put it so large that you basically aren't putting up a, a cutoff at all. Um, so, and to kind of see why that happens, and, and I find this useful. So the number of particles uh, is infinite, right? In our in our model here, uh, number of pairs, but each further pair is uh, contributes less. But the further I go, the more particles there are. So yes, they contribute less, but there's more particles that far away. And so now it's a balance between how far, how fast the uh, the interaction falls off, and uh, how many particles there are, whether I can even do a cutoff or not. And it turns out that, that for gravity and for electrostatics, you cannot do that. And you're, you're throwing away physical effects that are important. So we're back to the order n squared methods, um, which you can do, but it's obviously very, very expensive. And so there are other techniques uh, for these kind of interactions that do help you, because it is true that some sort of uh, that you have now, rather than one particle that contributes well, you have many particles that contribute a little bit. So you could imagine doing some sort of averaging procedures to help you out, and that's exactly kind of what you're doing. Exactly kind of. Um, so one of those techniques is Barnes Hut. Uh, what you do is you clump particles together into cells, and if you have too many particles in a cell, you further subdivide it, um, and and then you can get trees like this. Uh, so why does it help? Because rather than having every pair, some of them are just clumped together. So it isn't the case that they're in, unimportant, but uh, the difference between the uh, contributions of the different particles in these little boxes is so little that we might as well compute only one and multiply it by, say, four if there's four of those, of those particles in there. Um, and that works nicely. Uh, but you have to do this dynamically, especially if you're doing things like uh, uh, gravity, where you can get very inhomogeneous structures. Um, so it's it's a little bit like a mesh, but there is no mesh here, right? That there are just particles, and I'm grouping the particles together, and then I'm saying these particles are similar enough that I consider them as one big particle. So it's it's more of a coarse graining than a, than an adaptive meshing, but it is adaptive in that it depends on where the particles are, which ones I group together. Uh, another way to do this is to to again think of this idea of um, the particles are kind of far away, so it doesn't really matter exactly where they are, at least for the far away particles. And so let's do something different. So this is for this works actually very nicely for gravity or for uh, for the electrostatics. Um, imagine that I have these uh, these bluish particles here, so they're not so bright. Um, that have positions that are any they, they can be anywhere, right? They're not living on a grid. But I'm going to put them on a grid anyway. So I'm going to superimpose some sort of grid. I choose it to grid size. And, and I'm going to split these particles up into contributions that live on these grid points. Why would I do that? Well, I would do that because one way to compute the forces 
the gravitational forces is not to do this sum over pairs, but to compute the gravitational potential. So the and then take the derivative of that as the uh, as the force. And um, the gravitational potential can be determined from uh, from this equation here. That's Laplace. That the Laplace on the potential is uh, four pi g times the density. Now that with this uh, this this nice uh, double derivative with respect to uh, space to x or, or x and y, I can transform that. I can Fourier transform that, and then it becomes a much simpler expression where uh, phi hat, so that's the Fourier transform of phi, is equal to minus four pi g rho hat divided by k squared, where k, so there should be an index k here, but uh, k was the, uh, the, the wave vector. Right? So this is just, once I have the density, I just have to divide by k squared and I get my potential. Then I can Fourier transform back, get my potential and, and, and go on. Or I can compute the Fourier transform of the force, which is just multiplying by ik, and then transform back. And here, our, our friend the Fourier transform comes into play again, because this is now on a discrete lattice. This is a discrete Fourier transform for which we have a fast algorithm. So we can, so it's kind of um, uh, putting a whole bunch of things together. I have particles of which I actually don't care exactly where they are, but I do need their contribution. I split them up in some sort of uh, way that depends on how close they are on all these particles to a grid. Now I have a density on a grid. For a density on a grid, I can compute its Fourier transform. So now I have the Fourier transform density. From that, I can find the Fourier transform of the gravitational potential. From that, I can find the Fourier transform of the force from which I can then uh, Fourier invert because it's still all living on, on this grid and get the forces um, at, that, that, that are felt at each point in this grid. So these forces are now so, so because our Fourier transform, our fast Fourier transform is of order n log n, where n is now the number of bit points, um, so that it's not exactly the number of particles, um, this is a speed up. No, so there is a, we're making, it's not an exact method. We're making an, an, an approximation that is of the order of how, uh, how far away these particles are from the grid. So the finer the grid is, the better the approximation and how fine I have to make my grid uh, depends on, on basically how, how accurate I want to, want to simulate this. But there is a bit of a trickiness here. Um, the, mesh size that would be appropriate for particles that are close together to be accurately reflected should be different from far away. Far away, I can probably get away with a fairly wide mesh, whereas close together, things, things matter more. Um, so there's a, a, a refinement of this method um, called uh, a particle, particle, uh, particle mesh, where for the local particles, you say that it's uh, you, you do the real sum, but for faraway particles, you put them on a grid. And so that's a little bit tricky to do because where do you put a cutoff, but it can be done. So that's called particle, particle, particle mesh. There's particle, particle interactions and particle mesh interactions. That's where it comes from. Sometimes abbreviated to P3M, uh, but it still gives you that, that, that N log N scaling because the number of particles in your intermediate environments that you need to do explicitly is, is finite. So that's that's a good method for, uh, and that's often used in uh, gravitational simulations for uh, molecular dynamics, where you don't just have electrostatics, but you also have uh, higher multiple uh, uh, things to take care of. Uh, a more common approach is Ewald sums, and uh, since things are denser. Or, or more uniform in molecular dynamics, they make a little bit more sense because the, the, the cutoff in 4P3M is not so clear for them. Um, Ewell summation does it uh, in a, in a, does a similar thing. I'm not gonna go into what it does exactly, it's too, too long, but it doesn't exactly use a grid. It still uses Fourier transforms and, and, and clever things like that. Um, but not having to do it on a grid means it's more accurate, uh, but you pay for that because it actually scales as n to the three halves rather than n log n, but it's still a lot better than n squared. Yeah. 
Yeah, Marcel is making a, a, a few good points. Um, but yeah. Let's see what I, okay, so those are your short range interactions of atoms and large range interactions of, of uh, electrostatics or gravity. Molecular dynamics has a yet another kind of interactions that they have to take care of. So those are bonding interactions. So these atoms could be bonded into molecules, and then these molecules can have internal degrees of freedom that they can that, and, and they can move. Um, so if you just had say a, a molecule made out of two atoms, the only thing that can really happen is they can vibrate. And their density, their, sorry, their distance uh, vibrates, right? But if you have a, a linear module mo molecule, you can imagine that uh, not just the distance matters, also the angle between subsequent links between in the chain, uh, uh, so the bond angle or the torsion angle, um, they can they can matter as well. And so um, this comes now down to to how accurately do accurately do you need to model things? The distance between atoms tends to vibrate really really quickly. And so sometimes it makes sense to rather than consider that as a degree of freedom to fix it. To say it's a fixed distance, there's a constraint, and I just make sure that that constraint is always satisfied, which means you have to adapt your algorithm, but it can, this can be done. Uh, the, the point that that, that that tries to solve is that if the distance vibrates at a very, very fast rate, the time step is, is related to one over that, right? So the time step has to be uh, much, much smaller, which means I have to compute way longer uh, to get to the actual physics or the actual chemistry that I want to compute. Um, and so that, that's, that's a, a trick uh, where, where you, you make sure that the fastest degree of freedom are frozen. There are, again, that's, that's obviously an approximation, but it can be very important to get to a reasonable time scale. Some molecules are really rigid, like they, they are like water, for instance, it vibrates in all kinds of directions. It is a, a three atom a molecule. So there's all very fast. And so in very, very many cases, you can just say, this is the small, these, uh, the relative positions of all these atoms in, in, in water molecules are fixed. And it can, but now, it, now you have a rotating body because it's still uh, the direction in which everything points still matters. So again, different techniques are needed there to, uh, to take care of, uh, of the degrees of freedom that are still possible, like rotation. Um, then finally, okay. so we have all these, all these techniques. Uh, we have to keep in mind what we are really after um, in, the, in the grand scheme of things that we don't throw away um, things for the, for the sake of efficiency. So efficiency is important because, because we want to get to large time scales. Accuracy is important, but mostly just so that we don't get unphysical stuff. We don't want particles moving through each other when that cannot happen. Um, we need stability, so we don't need our system to, to, to explode, to have their energy rise indefinitely for no reason but, but the choice of algorithm. Um, and then we want them to, to respect certain physical laws. It depends on the system which ones are, are important, but um, conservation of energy is important in a isolated system. A system that works in, infinite, in an infinite space needs to have conservation of linear momentum. Um, you could have conservation of angular momentum. Uh, phase space volume is important if you want to do a good sampling of phase space. So all of these are more important than the exact accuracy. Uh, and on top of that, we are doing sampling here. So we don't really need the trajectory to be perfectly uh, uh, realistic. We just needed to sample all of the configurations well enough, right? So that's those are. This is why in MD you can take shortcuts that you wouldn't want to take in any other system, because they still satisfy the real requirements, which is it has to be physical, it has to respect physical laws, it has to uh, sample phase space, and it has to be efficient. So one way to do that is to use what are called symplectic integrators. We talked a little bit about that in OD in the OD lecture, um, and what they do because I, I don't have the time to go through it in detail, is to ensure that this system is, a, is not an approximation to a Hamiltonian system, but is actually a real Hamiltonian system. Um, so it, it, it obeys Newton's equation, but it does it in steps, where each step is a solution of a slightly different uh, uh, Newton's equation with slightly different forces um, or slightly different uh, momenta, such that each step is an approximation, 
the whole thing is a good approximation to your real system, but because each step is actually a real dynamics, you don't get unphysical uh, behavior. So the way you can you can set this up, here's the momentum fillet scheme, is to take uh, what looks like a very naive um, uh, uh, x plus vt plus one half a t squared kind of approach where the, the, the acceleration is the force. Uh, but to compute the momentum at the next step, you take this average of the forces before and after. That looks like the midpoint thing. And this is one of the reasons the, that it is stable. It does do sort of a midpoint thing. Um, and so this, this works really nicely. It doesn't require two forces because the next force is already is also needed uh, uh, in, the, in the previous one. So you just have one force computation per step, even though you take the average of the previous step and the, and the current step forces. So what does symplectic mean in, in this is really to have an approximate dynamics that is that still preserves the aspects of the original dynamics. So um, you this can be used to prove that you're sampling phase space nicely. Um, and you don't have drift, so you can't have energy increasing indefinitely. Um, uh, you can show that it it helps, um, or it can be it could helps to show or to argue that your uh, your solution is actually close to a, a real solution. Another way to write this uh, same scheme, so same symplectic scheme, uh, scheme, and it's about as simple as you can, is to take half steps. So you can say that you 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 propagate your momentum t by a half step, so you get an n plus one half by taking just half the force, and then do a real step in 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 position, and then a half step, and that is actually how it really looks more like a sort of middle part looks like free streaming, like a like a free motion, uh, but the other steps then take care of the interaction and only the interaction, only the interaction, um, and that and that is that is uh, why this is called a, a momentum relay because it, it's a half momentum step, a full position step, and a half momentum step. So this sort of interleaving of different steps is very typical for symplectic integrators. You can come up with with different schemes that are more accurate um, if you want, or or you can stick with this one that has uh, that allows for a fairly large h. H was a time step. Um, um, and so that's, that is very positive. Other words of this are velocity fillet, uh, because momentum or velocity are, are fairly interchangeable in this context, or leapfrog is another way to call this, because the momentum lives on, on half of the, on, on the interleaving grid between positions. Um, so, yeah. uh, okay, so if you wanted, so we're, we're almost there, but if you want an example of how a code like this looks, um, I, I have a, a code that we use for a, an old course in our Git repo, so you could clone it, and it's it's modular. And um, here's where sort of object-oriented programming does work out because there are objects like atoms, uh, but um, and and modularity helps because we don't have something to do the initialization. You'll have something to compute the forces. Um, it has cell division, so it does something for that. Um, it has a random number generator. It uses that for the initial conditions. Um, so, so the modularity helps in understanding this code. So, if you want to take a, take a look at a a working real uh, Leonard Jones simulation, um, be my guest. Um, we're not going to use this, but it, it might be nice to look at some real code, and, and it's right there. Um, okay, so that that is um, molecular dynamic simulation. Now, the funny thing about it is there are so many aspects here. That is actually very rare that you have a library that does molecular dynamics. That is that is kind of unusual. Most people do molecular dynamics either write their own code from scratch. Uh, that's that's quite an undertaking. I've been in that field, uh, or they use existing codes that are flexible enough that you can put in what kind of particles you want, what interactions, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other knobs that you can uh, can uh, turn. Uh, lamps, Chromax, NAMD, Amber. Are, are such examples. Uh, one of the few uh, library-based approaches is a, a library called OpenMM. It also works as an application, but it, uh, um, it's very nice. It can work on graphics cards as well. You can interface it from Python so that you sort of get the best of both, both worlds. But without knowing um, the context of how molecular dynamic simulations are supposed to be done, there's no way you could actually figure out how how to use them. So you, you need you need a bit of understanding. If you want uh, a bit more background of this, um, 
there are some old, uh, there are over 10 years old notes now from a course that I gave in chemistry together with uh, Professor Jeremy Schofield, um, a whole graded course just on, on molecular dynamic simulation. So if you want to, to look into that and, and know more, um, there's many, many parts that, that, that are very fascinating. This, this, this was originally my research field. So um, this, is, uh, this is there for you if you want it. If you like, if you prefer working from a book, um, the book from uh, Franco Smith is very clear, Understanding Molecular Dynamics. I can, there's probably a newer edition by now, but in any case, I can, I can recommend that. Um, if you, and, and if you wanna see how it, how it sort of step-by-step step can be implemented, so a more code centric uh, approaches in the book by Rappaport that, uh, that does a really good job as well. Um, but it, it, you really have to follow that almost from beginning to the end because it really gives you a way to, to implement all of these things in, in code. I think it's C or C++, I forgot, but um, yeah. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'd hope to talk a little bit more about NBody, but I, I think uh, I think I won't in the interest of time. Um, it's it yeah. So I hope it was clear that while it is an ordinary differential equation, there are so many things that you have to take care of, and so many things that actually do not matter so much, like the like pure accuracy of the solution, um, that it, it's worth knowing these aspects. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're doing molecular dynamics, it is very likely that you're gonna. Uh, work around these own these these standard codes. Most re most research groups that use this as a means to say study biomolecules or study uh, material science uh, mater materials, um, they use codes like these. There are people um, that study how these algorithms should be used, and they are the ones that might be, be writing their own. Um, and uh, and that's that's fine too. Questions. Yes, so I, I will, I, I understand this is a lot to digest. Um, that's, as I said, this is really a condensed form of a whole graduate course, if you think about it. Um, the good thing is, because it is in, in standard codes, uh, there is no way we can make you do an, an assignment on this. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you should know that this, this is the, 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 the name of the game. If, yeah, so if there's anything that like, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, um, talk about some of the, the concepts here, uh, but yeah, I, I do want to mention that there's a, there's a whole set of lecture notes that goes into detail. Oh, the link is not there anymore. Oh, they moved, they moved the links. Okay, I'll change that in the slides. It's not up yet, so just, I can change that before I put the slides up. Thanks, Marcelo. The last scheme, which one? Yeah, that one. Okay, so that's, so there's no, there's no specific volumes mentioned here, um, right? That it's just a momentum change by half a step. Um, and and then a, a full step for for positions using those momenta, those new momenta, and then the momenta are updated with a new force. This this force is then computed from the old, uh, from the new positions. Because so I was thinking of of um, where finite volume schemes um, solve for both the center of the of the grip of the cell and but you're still trying to solve at the boundaries as well to enforce yeah. a, con a conservation law yes yes and and yeah so in that sense yes um and and so one way to see this is is this interleaving of of, of position but it is all meant to because one thing that this this first um um let's look at this at, at, at the, the middle part the middle part is a perfectly valid a set of equations, but for uh, for a different system that has no potential energy, it's just free motion. But I do know that the the kinetic energy in that system and also the total energy, because there's no energy, is conserved. So this conserves energy, but its own energy. And the same 
happens to be true for this step. This conserves energy, but its own energy. And it's here too, this conserves energy, but only its own energy. And these are all, if, if once I add those three up again, I already half this, all this, half this, I get a different energy. Um, it's not quite adding up that you do, but um, you get a new energy that is, uh, that is conserved uh, manifestly, if you want, uh, but, uh, but that isn't the actual energy of the real system. It is just close to it and it's off by an order H squared which means that I can, I can now control. So rather than simulating my real system, I'm simulating actually a different system that also has a Hamiltonian energy function, uh, but it's just not quite the same, um, but it is H square close to my real one. And so, because I know that I can say, well, I'm, I'm, si I, I'm sampling essentially the same thing with, uh, with weights that are maybe of order H square off. And if I want it more accurate, now I can, take my time step smaller and I can see if I get the same result. And if I do, then apparently I, I was close enough. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, oh, that's nice to hear. Thanks, Mara.